This is our complete guide to kayak camping gear in 2024. We're gonna take you through step-by-step step almost every piece of gear that we bring on most of our trips. We do carry quite a lot of gear, but that's why we love kayak camping is because we can fit all of this stuff on our kayaks and we don't have to backpack it in somewhere. If you're watching this video, you probably already have a kayak and a paddle. We like new canoe kayaks for their insane carrying capacity. Some of the kayaks you see in our videos have a 700 pound weight limit. I believe this is more than any other kayak on the market and it's part of the reason why we're able to carry so much stuff, including dogs and kids on our boats with us on the river. As for paddles, the biggest consideration that you have to make is gonna be the length and the material it's made out of. They range from aluminum being the cheapest but also the heaviest, to carbon fiber being the lightest weight, but also the most expensive. We've played with paddles from a lot of different manufacturers made of almost every material that they come in. So look out for a video where we tell you about our paddles. I wear the Astral PFD on most of our adventures out on the river. A few considerations if you don't already have a PFD is to make sure that you're looking for one with a high back. You're gonna want something that you can lean back in your seat and be comfortable and not have to be stooped forward. Another consideration you might be looking for when choosing a PFD is how many pockets it has or what you might be able to to carry. I use a PFD made by NRS. It's got a ton of pockets on it. Fishing PFDs will tend to have a lot more pockets, but they also carry a heavier price tag. As much as we love ordering stuff online, you may want to actually go to a local retailer for a PFD to make sure it fits the way you want it to. You're going to need sturdy footwear with hard soles to protect your feet. I wear the Merrill Vapor Glove while I'm out on the river. It does a really good job of staying on my feet if I'm needing to get out of my boat and portage. It also does a great job of keeping rocks and debris out of my shoes and keeping my feet safe. I'm pretty impressed with the Vapor Gloves so far. We've been on a lot of trips with them and they're not showing any signs of coming apart or the soles separating from the shoes. I think they're actually trail runners technically, uh, but they work really well. It's a good idea to bring a second set of shoes with you for wearing around a camp. Even though the Vapor Gloves do a nice job of drying off, it is nice to be able to kick off the sandy, wet shoes you're wearing and put on a nice comfy pair of flip-flops or sandals for time to relax around the campfire. I did start my kayak camping journey in Crocs, and while there's nothing wrong with them, especially for around camp, they do tend to collect a lot of rocks and debris in the bottom of them, and strong currents can swipe them right off your feet and send them downstream. We pack most of our items into two different types of dry bags. One, as you see here, a roll top bag, and the other zippered. The roll top bags are really great for keeping water out. They're very secure, and easy to open and close. The only downside is that if you put something in the bottom, everything else has to come out first. Zippered bags are more vulnerable to water, but they also allow you greater access to all of your items inside. Our favorite roll tops so far are made by Remote Designs, which is awesome because we were excited to get to buy them from Gatewood Brown, who was the inspiration for us to start this YouTube channel. Thanks, Gatewood. Dry boxes are obviously more secure, so if you have fragile items that you don't want taking an impact, these work really well. They're also the least vulnerable to water, in my opinion. They can't get poked or end up with a little rip in the seam that causes a huge problem for you. So if you have really important valuables to you, electronics, your phone, your wallet, your keys, we tend to put items like that into the dry boxes. You're also gonna need a way to secure all this stuff to your boats. The most obvious direction to go with that is bungees. Lashing stuff down to your boat securely is super important because if you flip, you don't want a yard sail floating down the river. However, bungees don't always work the best and we've seen a lot of items floating down the river because they just weren't secure enough. And that's where carabiners come in. You can see we have this big old carabiner and this is for clipping things to like a seat. This will clip to almost anything. But smaller carabiners will actually clip right into the eyelets or hooks that you're using to lash your bungees to. This item made it very high up onto the list because it's really, really important to me. And that's a trash bag. Please do not litter in our beautiful wilderness areas and streams. If you do, I will find you. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. They're relatively cheap and typically you can pick up one maybe even for free from one of the outfitters or liveries on the stream. This one here is made by Okuna. I like it because it has a rigid piece of plastic that Velcros to the top that makes it easier to get your trash in. When you're on the water, your stuff is going to get wet. You're either gonna splash water up onto it or end up tipping in. Uh, I had a towel and a set of clothes draped over the back of my yak and when I went over, it was gone. Because of this, I now carry a mesh bag on the kayak with me. It allows me to be able to put damp items in so that they can continue to dry in the sun while also not being lost to the depths of the water. <laughs> the depths. <laughs> so are your clothes don't be taken by oh. Davy Jones' locker. 
what happened. You want a comfortable way to sit and relax when you get to camp. So you may want to bring a camp chair. It just so happens that new canoe kayaks have removable chairs that you can take with you into your campsite to relax that way. There are a lot of lightweight camp chair options that you could throw on your kayak. I can't recommend any because we just don't have any experience with them yet. You're going to need a place to call home on the river. That could be a tent or a hammock. We typically don't hammock camp because on rivers, trees that are the right distance apart can be sparse. And sometimes a hammock camper may have to walk up the bank a little bit off the gravel bar to find a suitable place to hang their home. You'll find that we use a lot of Big Agnes gear and the tent is no exception. We have a couple of different Big Agnes tents, but typically we wind up bringing the Spicer Peak 4. When choosing a site to set up your tent, you want to make sure that it's relatively level without a lot of sticks or rocks that could poke up through the bottom of your tent. You're gonna to wanna to make sure to lay down a tarp to prevent any holes and keep your tent protected. It's worth mentioning that stakes don't always work well in gravel or in sand. So if you're needing to tie down a rain fly or if you have a type of tent that is not freestanding and must be staked to work, that's a consideration that you might want to have in mind. We faced 45 mile an hour winds before on camping trips. Somebody's tent blew away like 200 yards. We ended up tying the tents down to boats and coolers because stakes just weren't cutting it. When it comes to a sleeping system, it all starts with the surface you're sleeping on, and that's gonna be your sleeping pad. When it came to inflatables, I was originally pretty skeptical, especially because of my size. However, it seems like inflatable sleeping pads are indeed the way to go. We're running Big Agnes here once again. We use the Rapide SL in two different sizes, the 40 inch and the 20 inch put together. That way, our Kelty double wide sleeping bag can go right on the top. We've actually already got a review on the Rapid SL. You can go check it out on our channel. It's also worth noting that I can take two of Big Agnes's sleeping pads and stack them one on top of the other and roll them up and fit them in the same compression sack. I've already told you we use a Kelty double wide sleeping bag and we really like this because it allows us to share the heat and it's a little more versatile. I can kick a foot out on my side where she can stay tucked in and warm on hers. And we get to cuddle. I really like the double wide sleeping bag because it feels a lot more like I'm sleeping at home. Uh, I don't feel confined by the one person sleeping bag. I can really kind of spread out and enjoy the room that I have. Uh, it feels just more like a big quilt thrown over the top of me. You're gonna need a place to lay your head. We started with these Sea to Summit Eros inflatable pillows, and while they pack up super small and are really lightweight, they're not all that comfortable. I mean, they're not terrible or anything, but nothing really beats a real pillow. We now use the Thermarest compressible pillow. Uh, it allows us to be able to adjust our comfort there's a drawstring on the back that you can adjust for your comfort level. I prefer to sleep with two pillows. If I end up on my side, I'm so broad shouldered that I'll wake up with a crick in my neck if I don't. I like to use the inflatable pillow on the bottom because it's very firm and then get that nice, comfortable, soft top with the Thermarest pillow. You're gonna need to bring some personal items with you to stay comfortable if you're doing overnight or especially extended trips. Make sure you check the regulations on the stream where you're gonna be paddling so you know how to dispose of your waste properly. The most common method is to dig a cat hole, in which case you're gonna need a trowel. A lightweight plastic trowel will do the trick just fine. Make sure you bring some toilet paper, you're gonna need that. In most places, you'll need to be at least 100 feet away from the water and dig your cat hole at least six to eight inches. I can't tell you how many times that I've discovered human waste and toilet paper just sitting on the banks of rivers. It's disgusting, guys. Make sure you're doing your due diligence and learn how to dispose of your waste properly on our rivers. And ladies, if you're in need of using feminine hygiene products, please pack them out with you. I know it's gross and nobody wants to do it, but I also really don't wanna see them on the side of the river. With these things in mind, you're probably gonna to wanna to bring some hand sanitizer too. You're definitely gonna want sunscreen. And even though it's not the most eco-friendly thing, we usually use the aerosol variety because it's so easy to reapply over and over again. And you're gonna to need to do that. There's always somebody who doesn't wear sunscreen. I don't burn. The bug spray we typically take is either Picardin or lemon eucalyptus. We try to stay away from DEET. Jean-Luc Picardin. Captain, USS Enterprise. You're gonna want chapstick too because wind burnt lips are a real thing. Along with your chapstick, go ahead and throw your toothbrush, toothpaste, hair comb, any small you personal- said toothpaste. <laughs> your toothpaste, your toothbrush, your comb, any other personal items that you need for hygiene. I also pack a river friendly soap with me. This can be used to wash your body, hair, dishes, clothes, pretty much anything that you might need clean on your trip. All of our toiletries and personal items typically go in one bag that ends up in the bottom of our roll top because we usually don't need to access it until we're at camp later in the evening when we've already got our tent set up. You're gonna want a way to dry yourself without the weight and bulkiness of a traditional beach towel. So we pack these lightweight microfiber towels that get the job done. Keep us dry, small, lightweight. 
When it comes to your drinking water, you're obviously gonna need a container to carry it around in. I still prefer these big stainless steel vacuum sealed jugs, even though they're a lot heavier, because the sun beating down in your water bottle can actually heat your water up and make it sort of unpleasant to drink. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with a Nalgene or a regular old water bottle either, especially if you're using a water filtration system like a Life Straw or a pump that's actually threaded to fit on the top of your Nalgene. Our preference for filtering water is the gravity style filters. While they do take longer overall to filter your water, you can walk away from them. So and that way they're more efficient and it saves you time. You just hang your bag up, walk away, come back maybe five or 10 minutes later and you have an abundant supply of drinking water. We use the Platypus three liter bags. We're actually on our second filter of these. We've had this for like 10 years. It works amazing. I also like the larger quantity gravity fed systems as it allows me to have more water and access to it while cooking. You're gonna need some essential items to keep you safe and deal with the wilderness. The first item on that list for me is gonna be a trauma kit. And I actually carry these around anyway, regardless of whether or not I'm out kayak camping. This is gonna contain really important trauma medicine items, such as a tourniquet, Israeli bandage, hemostatic gauze, amongst other things. You may not know how to use all the stuff in a trauma kit, but someone else floating down the river that day might. So it can't hurt to bring this stuff with you. It could save a life. Along with the trauma kit, we also carry a first aid kit. While the trauma kit covers big injuries, the first aid kit covers boo-boos. We also carry over-the-counter pain medications, antihistamines, and anti-acids. If you have daily prescription medications, don't forget to bring them. If you're gonna be out in the wilderness, you're gonna need a way to start a fire at camp. Processing firewood is usually the first thing that we do when we arrive at a new campsite. Firewood, check. Nothing really beats these folding saws. They work really, really well. We've tried a few different brands. None of them is particularly better than the other that we've found. I also really wanna try one of the folding bow saws. If you guys have, leave a comment and let me know how you like them. It's really easy to get carried away with how you start your fires, using like the little flint sparky things or whatever the case may be. Nothing beats a good old fashioned Bic lighter. One of the members of our group is sort of a pyro and always winds up with a different sort of fire starter on every trip. And I've got some leftover fire starters of his. Okay, these are really convenient, they work really well. I'm more of like the Boy Scout direction where I just try to gather some dry kindling. It's sort of a preference thing. We like to bring some extra cordage with us. 550 cord can do a ton of different things for you. That also goes for Gorilla Tape, anywhere from patching tents to even patching boats. We have used Gorilla Tape on the side of the river way more times than I can actually count. If you think there's a chance you might need spare parts for your boat, go ahead and bring them. I suggest getting extra drain plugs from your boat manufacturer. When we covered sleeping pads, I know you showed some reservation towards the inflatable mattresses. This is the reason why. If you don't wanna be sleeping on rocks, just in case, please bring your patch kits. Camping and cookware is where this can get a little wild and your mileage may vary on how much stuff you actually wanna bring, but believe it or not, that's one of our favorite parts of these trips is cooking at the side of the river. The first camping cookware I ever bought is this GSI Soloist. It actually works really, really well for two people because it contains the pot for boiling water and a bowl. So we're typically able to share this and have containers for two people. Sometimes a bowl isn't the ideal way to eat some of the meals that we prepare. And in that case, we do have an extra plate. Inside the pot for the Soloist, you can fit one of the smaller isobutane fuel containers. We typically bring a bigger one because a lot of our extended trips will actually use up one of those small ones. I've also got an MSR pocket rocket and that fits really nicely inside the Soloist. You will need flatware. Sporks are probably the most popular option because they do it all. <laughs> These are a little bit overboard. You don't need a super lightweight titanium spork. I'm sure they'll last forever. However, you could go to Walmart and pick up an Ozark Trail spork for like a fifth of the cost, and it's probably gonna last a long time. And if you're like me, I can't survive, especially an extended trip without some coffee. I love making coffee in the mornings and listening to the sounds of the wildlife and the river while I sip my morning joe. So I've just got one of these old school coffee pots. I'm sure you've seen in the videos, I don't make it like normal cowboy coffee. I actually prefer it more like drip coffee. It takes a little longer, but I prefer the way that it tastes. This extra mug's for freeloaders who don't bring their own coffee crap. And because I prefer freshly ground coffee beans, I've got this GSI coffee grind. It is manually powered, so it takes a little bit of elbow grease and some extra time, but it really is worth it for me to bring. It might be completely unnecessary for you. When it comes to cooking, I really love my stainless steel skillet and my Dutch oven. I feel like by bringing both, it allows me a wider range of meals. I like to pair both of these pans with a grill. It allows me to have a level cooking surface and have more control of the temperature. For cooking utensils, I'm currently using the GSI spatula and ladle. 
They fold up, which is great for convenience. We recently added this welder's glove to our kitchen gear. We haven't had a chance to use it yet, but using hot pads typically leads to singed arm hair or other burns. It's kind of hard to get stuff off the fire with a small hot pad. So we're looking forward to using this. We'll let you know how it goes. For cleaning my cooking gear, I typically really like to just use the sand or silt that's along the riverbed, scrub it out real good, put a little water in it and use the heat of the fire to sterilize. Sometimes that doesn't cut it though, and I will bring out the scrub daddy. I will use that with a clay based cleanser that allows me to really scrub and get whatever on the pans might be remaining. And yes, there are particular ways that you need to clean cast iron and keep it seasoned throughout the trip. Cast iron people can get a little crazy in the YouTube comments. We love cast iron. We promise we're keeping our baby safe. Last year, we added a camp table to our gear and boy, we did not know what we were missing. Sure, it's a big item and it may be unnecessary for you, but there's something to be said for being able to set your stuff on a flat surface so things aren't being spilled or getting knocked over. And you can even pull it right up to your chair and have a comfortable surface to eat at. It also does a great job of keeping things out of reach of toddlers and away from dogs. All right, so to pack all this food in, you're obviously gonna need coolers. We typically bring both soft and hard insulated coolers. The hard coolers can be really heavy, but if you're taking an extended trip, there's really no substitute for keeping things cold. We'll share all of our tricks on how to pack for extended trips and get the best out of your coolers so items don't go bad in an upcoming video. I have had a soft cooler break on me. I'm not gonna say which brand because it may have been my fault but zippers are a vulnerable spot of those coolers. One of the first things that I would take into consideration when buying a hard cooler is actually the footprint. The Yeti 35 happens to fit absolutely perfect in between the gunnels of our new Canoe Unlimited. It's the first Yeti product I've ever bought, and honestly, I'm blown away by it. I kind of thought it might be some name brand hype, but it really is awesome. It's kept food longer than any of our other coolers. This is a topic that's really easy to get way too in depth on. Suffice it to say, I would bring one cooler that you're packing your food in and you only open at meal time or when you're ready to enjoy the items in that cooler. And another one that's for things like drinks or stuff that you just wanna keep cool on the water so that you're not spoiling the other items. So isn't the point of this whole endeavor to kind of get away from electronics and get some serene nature in our lives. Okay, but you can never completely get away from it. And there's some electronics that you're actually gonna need if you're doing an overnight. Do not go on an overnight without a headlamp. You need lots of different light sources, but headlamps are the most important. Obviously they free up your hands for doing things at camp, but you may find yourself paddling after dark if you can't find a campsite and you get yourself into trouble. You're gonna need this headlamp to be able to paddle and see. We have the Black Diamond Astro headlamps and they honestly run the gauntlet from budget affordable to insane professional level headlamps. So you can kind of choose whichever you want in there. We are really happy with them. And it goes without saying, carrying a normal old flashlight is a good idea too. This one's brighter and can throw the light a lot further than a headlamp if we need to see something a little further away. Like a raccoon getting into our buddy's tent. Another light source would also be the flex tail, although that's not the primary reason that we bring it. It's first and foremost the way that we blow up our sleeping pads, and it's also great for stoking the fire. No one likes hyperventilating just to get that fire going. It's also a bad idea to breathe into your sleeping pads, especially on colder nights. The moisture in there can ruin the insulative value. Alea, come in. I'm here. Make sure to bring walkie talkies on the trip. When we were floating the lower current, Alea and I got separated due to poor communication and Alea had our son Maxwell with her. What I didn't know is that I had selected the nice calm lazy channel and she had selected one with the insane two foot drop off waterfall. But, oh come on now. <laughs> was, that a, was that dramatic? Just a little. That being said, it was a channel that I did not feel comfortable taking Max and the dog on. Do I have the dog too? Probably. I did. <laughs> because Alea couldn't portage these rapids by herself with the kid and the dog, she had to drag her kayak along the bank all the way up to where the channels met and come down the direction that I went. That was the longest 20 or 30 minutes of my life because I didn't know if they were okay. Bring radios. Yeah, this was the moment that sparked our decision to go ahead and purchase some waterproof radios. These are the Motorola T605s. They are IP67 waterproof and they float. Uh, we've used them on a few trips now and we actually just really enjoy them because they're great for scouting out rapids or staying in communication if we deliberately decide to split up. They also have a weather radio function, which is really cool if you don't get cell reception and you need to check on weather conditions. This battery bank is definitely overkill for you. The reason that we bring it is because we have camera gear to recharge on these trips. We've never, even on a six day trip, used up all of the battery in this thing. So you probably don't need anything quite like this. However, 
However, if you are taking pictures with your cell phone, you need to stay in touch with relatives or maybe your employer, these little battery banks like this come in super handy for recharging cell phones and other small devices like the headlamps or the flex tail. A more comprehensive packing list will be in the description below so you can go back through and look at all the items that we mentioned in this video. If you're curious about the performance or how any of the individual items we mentioned have held up, leave a comment and we'll be sure to do a review on that particular thing. All right, get your bags packed, get your gear together, and let's get out on the river. Maybe we'll see you out there. Remember, adventure.